Have you ever wondered what actually happens to the crew inside a tank that looks like this? Or when a turret gets blown 50 feet into the air like this? I'm going to tell you at the end of this video where you can find footage of the aftermath. I'll warn you now, I don't recommend watching it. But what I will show you is something even more fascinating. The complete story of the T-72 tank. How a design from 50 years ago is still being used today. Why tens of thousands were built. And most importantly, why its crews keep dying in the exact same ways, in the exact same situations, decade after decade. By the end of this video, you'll understand why this tank terrified NATO for years and why it's now become a symbol of catastrophic failure on modern battlefields. Let's begin. The T-72's story starts in the 1960s, but to understand it, we need to go back even further to World War II. The Soviets had just won the largest tank battles in human history. Their T-34s had rolled across Europe in massive waves, crushing the technologically superior German panzers through sheer overwhelming numbers. Yes, Soviet losses were astronomical. Yes, tens of thousands of tank crews burned alive in their machines, but they won. And in the Soviet mind, that's what mattered. So when it came time to design the next generation of tanks, the doctrine was simple. Build something good enough that you can produce in massive quantities. Flood the battlefield with armor. Win through numbers. The first attempt was the T-64A, and it was genuinely revolutionary for its time. A 700-horsepower engine, a massive 125 smoothbore gun, composite armor that could stop NATO rounds. And here's the part that shocked Western intelligence, an automatic loader. This meant the tank only needed three crew members instead of four. It could be smaller, lighter, faster, and still hit just as hard as Western tanks. On paper, it was brilliant. In reality, the T-64 was a temperamental nightmare. It broke down constantly. It was expensive to build. It was difficult to maintain. Soviet generals quickly realized this wasn't the tank you'd give to conscripts in wartime. So they went back to the drawing board with a new goal. Take the advanced features of the T-64, but make it simple enough that you could build tens of thousands of them. Make it reliable enough that a barely trained crew could operate it. Make it cheap enough that losing hundreds wouldn't matter. What they created was Object 172, which would become the T-72, same autoloader, but now with a much more reliable V-12 diesel engine producing 780 horsepower. The design was intentionally old school, prioritizing practicality over cutting edge features. It wasn't meant to be the best tank in the world. It was meant to be the tank you could build 50 of for every one advanced T-80. And it worked. Production ramped up fast, 40 to 50% faster than the T-64. At a fraction of the cost, over the next decade, more than 25,000 T-72s would roll off assembly lines across the Soviet Union and its allies. It would become one of the most produced tanks in human history. And it was about to prove itself in combat in some of the most horrific ways imaginable. Before we get to the bloodshed, we need to understand what it's actually like inside oh, T-72. Because the design choices that made it cheap and easy to produce are the same choices that would kill thousands of crew members. Let's start with that autoloader everyone talks about. The T-72 stores 22 rounds in a rotating carousel directly beneath the turret floor. When the gunner selects a round, the carousel spins into position and a mechanical arm rams the shell into the breech. In theory, this is faster than a human loader, about seven seconds between shots if everything works perfectly. The benefits are real. The tank is a full meter shorter because you don't need space for a human loader to work. It's lighter. It has a lower profile, making it harder to hit. And the crew doesn't get tired during sustained combat. But here's what they don't tell you. The gunner and commander are squeezed into the turret with basically no room to move. They're sitting directly on top of the ammunition carousel, surrounded by high explosives on all sides. If they're not careful about where they put their hands or feet, the autoloader machinery will cheerfully remove them. And yes, there are multiple documented cases of exactly this happening. The commander's visibility is terrible compared to Western tanks. The gunner is even more cramped. Both of them are crammed between the massive gun breach and the turret walls, in a space so tight that quick evacuation is nearly impossible. 
And here's the thing that will become important later. Unlike modern Western tanks, which store ammunition in separate compartments with blowout panels, the T-72 just doesn't. The crew is sitting directly on top of their ammunition with basically no protection. Sure, the carousel itself has some armor around it, but the T-72 carries additional rounds scattered throughout the hull and turret, just lying there, exposed. If anything penetrates the armor and touches those rounds, everyone inside is about to have a very bad day. We'll come back to this. Now, the driver sits up front in the hull, and his position is actually pretty comfortable compared to the turret crew. The controls are relatively simple. The engine is reliable. There's just one small problem, the reverse gear. For some inexplicable reason, the T-72 can only reverse at about five kilometers per hour. That's three miles per hour. That's walking speed. So if you drive into a bad situation and need to back out quickly, you can't. You're committed. You're trapped. Remember that detail. It's going to matter. One interesting feature, the T-72 can ford rivers up to five meters deep using a snorkel system. The crew seals the entire tank, activates the overpressure system, which also protects against nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, and drives across the riverbed completely submerged. It's a neat party trick that's almost never used in actual combat because it's terrifying and requires extensive training. So we have a tank that's small, cheap, reliable, and packs serious firepower. A tank that can be produced by the thousands and operated by conscripts with minimal training. What could possibly go wrong? There's a story from 1982 that spread through NATO intelligence like wildfire. During the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, Syrian T-72s, fresh from the Soviet Union, engaged Israeli armor. According to reports, these T-72s knocked out Israel's cutting-edge Merkava tanks. The Merkava was supposed to be one of the best protected tanks in the world, and the T-72 was punching through them. NATO was alarmed. If the T-72 could defeat top-tier Western armor, and the Soviets had tens of thousands of them lined up at the Iron Curtain, this was a serious problem. Whether that Syrian story was entirely accurate or not, one thing was clear. By the early 1980s, the T-72 was a legitimate threat. Then came the Iran-Iraq War, and the T-72 got its first large-scale combat test. Saddam Hussein had purchased hundreds of T-72Ms from the Soviets, some of the most advanced models available for export. He threw them against Iran's aging fleet of American M60 Pattons and British Chieftains, tanks that were already outdated. The result? Absolute devastation. T-72s defeated entire Iranian divisions in hours. They became the most feared weapon of the war. Iraqi crews reported engaging and destroying enemy tanks before the Iranians even knew they were there. For a moment, it seemed like the Soviet design philosophy had been proven correct. The T-72 was the king of the battlefield. But this war also exposed something that would haunt T-72 crews for decades. In close urban combat, even the then-modern RPG-7 proved devastatingly effective against the T-72's side, rear, and roof armor. One well-placed hit from the right angle would trigger a massive internal explosion, detonating the entire ammunition load. The tank wouldn't just be disabled, it would be completely obliterated. Turret blown off, hull shredded, crew. Well, let's just say an open casket funeral wouldn't be an option. But still, Iraqi crews felt confident. They had the best Soviet tank available. They had decent training. They had experience. Then came 1991 and everything changed. If the Iran-Iraq war was the T-72's high point, Operation Desert Storm was its lowest. By 1991, Iraq had hundreds of T-72s in various configurations, plus thousands of older Soviet tanks. When the U.S.-led coalition rolled in, American commanders were genuinely concerned. They'd heard the stories about Syrian T-72s. They'd seen Iraq's performance against Iran. They knew the T-72 could take a hit and keep fighting. And here's the kicker. The Iraqis had the terrain advantage. Their tanks were dug into prepared defensive positions. American armor would have to advance across open desert, exposed and vulnerable. Every advantage was on Iraq's side. What happened next was one of the most lopsided armored engagements in military history, American M1. 
Abrams tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles engaged, Iraqi armor during a nighttime sandstorm. The Americans had thermal sights that could see through the darkness and sand. They had night vision. They had air support. They had coordination. The Iraqis had none of this. In a single engagement, about 150 T-72s were destroyed. American tank losses? Zero dot Iraqi crews were being hit and killed without ever seeing what was shooting at them. They couldn't return fire against an enemy they couldn't detect. Their thermal sights were inferior or non-existent. Their training was inadequate. Their ammunition couldn't penetrate American armor even when they got lucky shots. It was a massacre. Suddenly, the T-72 looked like nothing more than a coffin on tracks. Western media declared it obsolete. Military analysts wrote it off as Soviet junk. But here's the truth. It wasn't really a fair test of the tank itself. These were downgraded export models, manned by poorly trained crews, with no proper support or coordination, fighting against a technologically superior force with complete air dominance. Still, the myth of T-72 invincibility was shattered. And from this point forward, it was only going to get worse, especially for the crews inside. Now we come to 1994, and one of the most disastrous uses of armor in modern warfare. The First Chechen War would prove that the T-72, despite all its advantages, could be utterly helpless when used incorrectly. And Russian commanders were about to use it very, very incorrectly. Russia deployed massive armored columns of T-72s and T-80s into Chechnya, expecting a quick victory. Tanks would roll into the capital city of Grozny in parade formation. The Chechen fighters would see this overwhelming force and surrender. That's not what happened. Instead, Chechen fighters armed with RPG-7s and incredible amounts of courage set up ambushes throughout the bombed-out city. They organized into small hunter-killer teams and waited. They let the first Russian tanks roll deep into the city. Then, as the rear tanks were still entering, they struck. The rear vehicles were hit from all angles at close range. RPGs slamming into thin roof and rear armor. Machine guns and snipers cut down the infantry, caught in the open between the tanks. The main armored column was now trapped inside the city, with burning wrecks blocking their retreat. And here's where the T-72's design became a death trap. The tanks couldn't elevate their guns high enough to shoot at fighters in upper story windows. Remember that low profile we talked about? That compact design? It meant limited gun depression and elevation. Chechen fighters could shoot down at the tanks with impunity, while the Russian crews couldn't shoot back. When the tanks turned to engage one position, fighters from another direction would have clear shots at the thin armor on the turret rear or roof. One hit in the right spot would ignite the ammunition carousel and then the signature T-72 catastrophe. A massive internal explosion and the entire 40-ton turret launching into the air like a bottle rocket. In a single day of fighting, 20 out of 26 T-72s were destroyed. Along with dozens of other armored vehicles, Grozny earned the nickname Tank Cemetery. Surviving Russian tankers described the absolute horror of watching neighboring tanks brew up in fireballs, one after another, knowing they could be next. Knowing that if they got hit, there would be no time to escape. The flames and overpressure would kill them before they could even reach the hatches. The Russians learned a brutal lesson. Advancing in urban terrain without proper infantry support is suicide. Tanks need infantry to clear buildings and watch their flanks. Tanks need air support to suppress anti-tank teams. Tanks need reconnaissance to avoid ambushes. But here's the thing, they didn't really learn. Because we'd see the exact same mistakes repeated again and again. Just a few years earlier, in 1991, as Yugoslavia was tearing itself apart, the T-72 found itself in another urban nightmare. The Yugoslav army was using M84 tanks, basically a direct copy of the T-72 built under license. They deployed them to break Croatian resistance in the suburbs of Vukovar. There was a street called Trepinska Cesta. The Yugoslavs sent an armored column down this street, expecting to smash through lightly armed guerrillas with overwhelming firepower. Croatian fighters saw them coming and waited. They let the M84 tanks roll deep into the narrow street. No side streets, just houses on both sides, one way in and one way out. 
When most of the column was committed, the Croatians knocked out the lead and rear tanks with RPG-7s at point-blank range. The tanks were trapped. The street was too narrow to turn around. The reverse gear was too slow to back out under fire. Burning wrecks blocked both ends. And then the slaughter began. RPG teams engaged from such close range that they actually had problems with the weapons, Satusis. Minimum arming distance, a safety feature to prevent the warhead from detonating too close to the shooter. They were literally too close to safely fire. Dozens of tanks and armored vehicles were destroyed in quick succession. Some tried to push through the burning wrecks blocking the way. Others attempted to climb out through ditches beside the road and got stuck. The street earned the same nickname as Grozny, Cemetery of Tanks. Different war, different crews, same catastrophic failures, same design vulnerabilities, same deadly results. And now we come to the present day, where the T-72 faces threats its designers could never have imagined. Modern anti-tank weapons are on a completely different level. Tandem charge warheads designed specifically to defeat explosive reactive armor. Top attack systems like the Javelin that strike the thin roof armor from above. And of course, drones, cheap commercial drones modified to drop anti-tank grenades with surgical precision onto the weakest points of the tank. No amount of cage armor, no amount of add-on protection, no turtle tank modifications can defend against all these threats simultaneously. But here's the important part. This isn't just a T-72 problem. No tank currently in service was designed for this battlefield. Not the Abrams, not the Leopard, not the Challenger. Modern anti-tank weapons and drone warfare have fundamentally changed armored combat. The difference is that Russia is still fielding T-72s in massive numbers, using the same flawed tactics that failed in Chechnya and Yugoslavia. Unsupported armor advances, poor reconnaissance, inadequate infantry coordination, predictable routes, and we're seeing the same results. Turrets blown into the sky, burning hulls, and crews who never had a chance. The T-72 has been in service for over 50 years. It's fought in more conflicts than almost any other tank in history. It's been upgraded, modified, and rebuilt countless times, but its fundamental vulnerabilities remain. The cramped crew compartment, the ammunition stored throughout the hull, the limited situational awareness, the slow reverse speed, the autoloader that can kill you as easily as the enemy. So here we are, back where we started. What happens to a T-72 crew when their tank is hit? In the best case, if they're hit in the right spot and there's no ammunition detonation, they might have seconds to evacuate through hatches before fire and overpressure fill the compartment. The driver in the front hull has the best chance. There are documented cases of drivers surviving even after the turret was blown off. But in most cases, the explosion is instantaneous. The overpressure alone is lethal. And if you somehow survived that, the fire would finish the job before you could reach a hatch. Earlier, I mentioned you could find footage of the aftermath. I still don't recommend it, but if you really need to see the reality of what we've been discussing, you can find it on Reddit by searching for T-72 Grozny 1996. I'm warning you, it's not pretty. The T-72 isn't a bad tank, despite what you might think after this video. For its time and its purpose, it was actually quite effective. Cheap, reliable, powerful, and produced in massive numbers. But it was designed for a different kind of warfare. And when used incorrectly, without proper support, without proper tactics, without proper training, it becomes exactly what we've seen throughout this video. A death trap. If you found this deep dive interesting, hit that subscribe button. We've got plenty more stories like this covering military history from World War II to the present day. And let me know in the comments what vehicle or battle you want covered next. Thanks for watching.